Hello and welcome to Lightways at Life Astrology with me, Anna Isabel. I'm a clinical hypnotherapist and, of course, an astrologer. And I'm delighted to have Elizabeth Brooke, who seems to me to be a rather rare breed, an astrologer, herbalist. Welcome, Elizabeth. Thank you for having me. I have to say that the excitement of receiving a book through my letterbox never goes away. However, there are times when my heart does beat that little bit faster. Um, and the rece receiving your book was one of those moments. And it is called Traditional Western Herbal Medicine. And here it is. And I, it did not disappoint um, by any stretch of the imagination. The beginning, of course, as above, so below, as within, so without, as the universe, so the soul uh, drew me in. And then to my utter delight, two quotes from Culpepper. Um, my favorite of the two being the vegetable world with its occult virtues and power is of all others the sublimest subject for the exertion of genius and afford the highest gratification to a benevolent mind since there are no infirmities incidents to our fallen nature that it does not enable us to alleviate or remove and i you know it's that gentle world of a holistic approach where there is something that's very linked with divinity and something greater than us yeah. that to me when I read that quote. Um, so it would be good to hear your take on this. Well, Karl Pepper, of course, was writing in the 17th century. So that world had not disappeared. We hadn't had Paracelsus and the, I think therefore I am of Descartes. So it was a magical universe and they believed that the planets, it was a common belief that the planets and comets and eclipses affected people emotionally, physically and spiritually. It was a commonplace. The thing I love about Culpepper is he was also a radical. He was on the parliamentary side. He was on the side against um, the king and against the corruption of the court. He treated the poor and the rich alike. He believed in collecting your remedy from your surroundings, not to import fantastical remedies from overseas, because of course, uh, at that time, Britain was busy conquering the world and bringing all the things back into London. But he said, no, you should pick your medicines around you. You should pick them in sympathy with the day, the planets, the moon. And he said, you should be in that harmony with the natural world and the world of astrology. And it is the high point really of astrology and medicine in the 17th century. It makes complete sense to me that we would choose to use herbs that are at hand. Not only is it less costly, and in these days where we're thinking about carbon footprints, it would be nice to practice what we preach very simply by doing exactly that. But apart from any of those reasons, for me, you know, when it comes to food, we're, we're told fresh is best, and that the the nutrients of a plant are at their richest just after they are picked. So it makes sense to me that he would be saying, well, it's look around you and pick what's available to you. And also, you know, England is an incredibly fertile country. I was there in, in the countryside on Sunday, and it's extraordinary, it grows by the roadsides, the trees, the plants, the flowers, the fungi, massively fertile country. So there's no reason on earth to import stuff. And I think what's very important nowadays is that we've become separated from nature. 
if you could start to collect your rem your remedies, if you wild craft your remedies, if you walk on the little lanes and byways and through the meadows and the forests and the woods and the seashores, you're connecting with the heart of the country, the soul of the country. And this is a very ancient country, got huge tradition, and it feels like from my with my herbalist hat on, people were very ashamed of our pagan tradition when I trained as a herbalist, which was quite a long time ago, but very important I think to situate yourself where you are and there's also politics there there's a there's also the thing about not taking over other people's cultures and other people's spiritual practices so we have one Carl Pepper is our spiritual practice for England and probably for Europe so we should respect that and it's an absolute glory as a herbalist to go out on a summer's day with a big basket and wander through meadows. I mean, what is better? <laughs> it's absolutely gorgeous. And you can develop a relationship with the plants. Absolutely. Well, two weeks ago, and I shall be going there this week with, um, with some uh, paper bags to collect them, to collect some of them at least, um, on a walk with my dog and some friends, I could smell, I could smell chamomile. Yeah. And and I, I thought, and nobody else, of course, was aware that this was a smell that was there or that, because sometimes until you know it, it you might not pick it up unless somebody says to you, can you smell that? Because yes, it's absolutely. warm, but kind of delicate scent, isn't it? But I could smell it. And sure enough, um, along the path, there was chamomile. And I thought it was a small bank. Oh, no, there it lined the entire path. And the flowers had yet to open, so I'm hoping they've now opened. Um, but, and you know, my friend said, well, what are you going to do? And I said, well, you know, for a start, I can mix them with oats, put them in little bags, and oh my goodness, what a bath. <laughs> you know? Yes, absolutely, absolutely, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, it, so it's that, um, because I, I used to grow um, chamomile on my allotment and then it disappeared. And I've been trying to find chamomile seed, you know, to, and I've, I've, I've found, but it's not taken so well this year. And there it is. And I thought, oh, how wonderful. So you're right. It is certainly, um, there's a wealth of uh, plant friends with us. And coming back to the astrology side of it and the combination of the two, um, one of the things I really liked about your book is that you've got, you've divided it into two parts. There's um, theory and then there's practice. And I, I appreciate that because there's a whole context of explanation. And so perhaps you could explain more about maybe the, the, the theoretical part Okay. And I, I would say that I've been a herbalist for 40 years. So this is clinical practice. I'm Taurus rising. It's no good if it doesn't work. I've got a Libra moon. So I love systems. I love theories. I love to go flying into large places in my brain. But honestly, if it doesn't work, if it's not helpful, what use is it? So when I discovered this method, I immediately started using it in my clinical practice. So that's where it comes from. Um, and basically, we start with the four elements, which were discussed in ancient Greece. And it was interesting that on Kos, the island of Kos, there was a medical school where Hippocrates practiced and there was an astrology school. They were really close together. Um, anyway, we start with the four elements, earth, air, fire and water. And from the four elements, you get the four temperaments, which are choleric, which is fire, <coughs> excuse me, choleric, which is fire. Uh, sanguine, which is air, I'll just take some water. Melancholic, which is earth, and phlegmatic, which is water. Um, and then you, from that, you describe various systems of the body. You describe foods that they need to eat. You describe their emotional states. You describe sleep, rest, and of course, then you have the planet. And they're sl slightly different than the planets you get in modern astrology. For example, the melancholic um, 
temperament, which is Earth, is ruled by Saturn, which makes sense, but also Mercury. And people find that quite hard because Mercury seems quite airy. But of course, Mercury also rules Virgo, which is very earthy. Anyway, so the planets are, uh, the plants are ruled by the planets. So um, Saturnine herbs, comfrey, classic one. What the Saturn, what Saturn does in the body is it rules the bones and the solid structures of the body. And what does comfrey do? It works on the bones and the solid structures of the body. But also on another level, because I also work with plants from an emotional level, what does Saturn do? It grounds you, it calms you down and it grounds you. So that's a really good herb if you're going off in your head and you need to be grounded, calmed down, solidified, protected and so on. So, or, all the herbs that Culpeper used, which are all the herbs that he picked in his environment, are ruled by various planets. And generally speaking, I agree with all his rulerships. There's a lot of um, medical astrology in America, where particularly, where they're sort of adding things and changing it all around. And I feel like very um, cautious about doing that because I, I found that Culpepper system worked really well in the clinical setting. So I didn't feel a need to change it and to put my imprint on it, except for one or two exceptions. So people who've come across medical astrology have got a bit confused because this person says that and that person says that and this person's. So I would suggest that if anyone's interested is they follow one system and they see if it works for them. The other thing about planets is that they rule the seven days of the week because there are seven planets, traditional planets. They rule the hours of the day. So uh, as you're in your meadow with your basket, you will pick herbs of Mars midday on a Tuesday because that's, that's Mars hour on a Mars day. So what you're doing is you're connecting into the macrocosm, the spiritual world. And I love that. I absolutely love that because it gives a rhythm and a ritual to your herb gathering. Because when I was um, trained, we just bought herbs in bottles, you know, and there wasn't any of that hands on spiritual energizing practice around our medicines. So I feel that's very important. And also, of course, the moon is very important in medicine. We wax and we weigh, and we're all affected by the full moon. And for me, when I pick my medicines in that way, I also make my medicines at the full moon and I leave them for a lunar cycle and then press them out. And when I see a client, I, I, I make a decumbrature chart. I do not diagnose from the natal chart. I, that to me is a no-no because we're all born with potential, I feel. What your, what your chart gives you is potential. And you cannot say, how it will manifest. And there's a lot of very doom laden analyses, facial charts saying, oh, this means you're going to have X and Y. No, 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 no. Uh, for example, I've got three planets in the sixth house, which is supposed to mean that you're going to have chronic ill health. I don't have chronic Ill, Ill health. I'm incredibly healthy, but I've worked with sick people all my life. That's the way it worked out. But you know, you could be very fatalistic. And I think it's it's important that you don't do that because. In, in the Aboriginal culture, they have a thing called pointing the bone where you say, oh, you're going to get this. And it's like almost like putting a spell on someone. So I feel very, very strongly that you shouldn't diagnose with a nasal chart. So when I see a client, I will draw up a decumbiture. And what that gives me shows me the client, shows me their condition. And of course, because you're dealing with planets, you're not just dealing with the physical, you're dealing with the emotional, the mental and the spiritual. You know, so if the illness is shown by Saturn, to go back to that, you know, it might be that you're overworking, which is very Saturnine. It might be you're depressed. It might be that you're suffering from conditions that are caused by poverty or religion. <laughs> all sorts of layers. There are all sorts of layers. Anyway, so that shows your illness. And then it shows what they're looking for uh, in a practitioner so it shows what they're looking for from me and that's fantastic because sometimes people want sympathy don't they the moon or venus sometimes people want hope so i'm shown by jupiter sometimes people want to be told what to do which would be saturn or they just want to talk a lot 
mercury, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So I find that very helpful, and that's the seventh house with the decumbiture. And also the tenth house will show you the kind of remedy they want. From the decumbiture, you can also use timing measures with the phases of the moon, which is also very interesting. And particularly if you're doing a hands-on practice, it will show you the best times to book your appointments because you have crises days. And those, you know, if you were doing something like massage or hypnotherapy or something, those would be the day to see your clients. Um, yes, yeah, so that's what I do with um, clinical patients, but also what you can do from the natal chart is to look at temperament and preventive medicine. And as I've got older, that's something I'm very interested in. And in the second half of the book, as you say, there's a way you can calculate your temperament from the natal chart. And that's basically the ascendant, the moon, the season you were born in and various other things. And that's really useful because that shows you how to stay healthy which is really important and is something that's not talked about. We tend to do firefighting in medicine and actually it's really important, especially particularly as you get older, to work out how you stay healthy or if you've had a health scare and you want to not, it, for it not to recur. Because, for example, to go back to Saturn and melancholy, if, you, if you're a melancholic type, as the name suggests, you will be prone to depression you know, you're prone to low mood, but some people say, you know, pessimists have a happier life because they're never disappointed. <laughs> you know, so there's also that. But what, what someone, sh a melancholic needs to do is to feel useful. Service is their thing. So you will ask people about that. W what are you doing? Because there's a lot of um, illness that happens post-retirement because people feel useless. And particularly for a melancholic type, what is your purpose and if you can't serve people you feel like you have no purpose so for a melancholic you would suggest that they absolutely engage in their community they get themselves an allotment or a garden they go for walks they get a dog you know they do all these things that involve routine and ritual which um melancholics love and also that they feel that there's a purpose and that they can help people and furthermore you would talk to them about diets so as a melancholic they haven't got very good digestions and they need to eat what I call peasant food, really simple food, no spices, not much oil, you know, soups and maybe some salads, but warm food like oats and that, those kind of things. And also not to overwork because that's a melancholic thing. They, they, they can get into overworking and then exhaust themselves. There's a whole variety of things you can do from that calculation. Because, of course, no one diet suits everybody. No one kind of life suits anyone. So, for example, if you were um, phlegmatic, phlegmatics who are watery love to sleep. They love to sleep. They love to float off. They love to eat. They hate exercise and they're quite chilly. And what you need as a, as a phlegmatic is a bit of ginger exercise even in some form or other that they can find that's um acceptable to them dancing is a good one because that's quite you know it's sort of beautiful but it is an exercise and encourage them not to eat cold food so phlegmatics should not eat salads for example we're all told to eat salads but no they need warming food whereas a choleric fire person loves all the spicy food and the curries and doesn't sleep very much and is very overactive they need the opposite kind of they need to calm down to cool down and to take remedies which ground them a bit and slow them down not that they listen <laughs> colorics are quite headstrong so they don't tend to listen <laughs> but all the herbs of mars are, are yeah choleric herbs so that's, that's what you can do with the birth chart. And it's quite a simple calculation. But if you're working in medicine, I, my, sense, my feeling is you've got to do it with a decumbiture because you may know that with horary, there are strictures, there are rules. So it, it's quite contained and it's quite analytical. So you can't go wandering off into kind of woolly thinking it's as it is. <laughs> well, I also like the fact that in the decumbiture charts, you, you take one look at it and you know whether or not you as the physician are going to, are, 
are going to find this difficult or not, or you, whether you're in a strong position to help or not. So what's to you when you when you see that and you think, hmm, uh oh, <laughs> I, I could be in trouble here. Well, I think manage expectations. And also, you know, be humble, think, well, maybe there's a better practitioner for them. That's okay. That's okay. But they have come to you. So you don't just send them away, but you talk about it. And you, you might think as you go through their case history that something else would be more appropriate. Um, yeah, so you'd have to be a bit skillful there, I think, because nobody wants to be told, nobody wants to be sent away. That's really up upsetting to people. I've always... I've kind of wondered, do you think that that is a reflection of you in that moment and that perhaps it would be better to reschedule for another day? Or is it really that perhaps this, the person isn't ready and therefore you're not going to be as effective? Or is it that perhaps you don't have enough uh, knowledge or skill to address the issues that are being presented? Could be a variety. I do think there has to be a compatibility. I mean, there's no coincidence with the people you attract to you. As an astrologer or as a practitioner, you will attract people that are a mirror to you. And I'm sure you've had that experience where you're going through something in your private life and whoa, they all come and present this to you. So, you know, it's not a random process. So if someone comes to you and you're not sure you can help them, there is something for both of you to learn because it, you, they might have come to you because someone recommended or they thought they wanted something that you offer but it's not appropriate to them um especially if there's a retrograde mercury on the decumbage i i still judge decumbages on a retrograde mercury but i bear in mind that i do not know everything something will be revealed later and that's what i bear in mind can't help everyone you know <laughs> sometimes you just have to know that and you may also, I, I've had those situations where you talk with someone, you think, I know exactly who you need to talk to, and it's not me. <laughs> and so that's, a, that's a, okay. And they will respect you if you explain why. Yes. But what I find really helpful is looking at the seventh house, because that's the practitioner, is um, finding out what they want, because um, I'm very optimistic, positive person, but some people don't want that. They want the awful truth, <laughs> the melancholics of this world. They want, you know, so I would be shown by Saturn. So I have to tell them what they've got to do. And I give them a list of very hard things to do. And they love it. They absolutely love being. And if you've got, if you're shown by Mars or there's a lot of Mars in the chart, then you say, well, this is very difficult. I'm not sure you'll be able to do it. And you, you, get, you engage their competitive spirit. Or, you know, you might be sympathetic and people just need to cry. And that's fine too isn't it you know that's fine so I find that really exciting looking at who they want me to be I mean fundamentally obviously I'm my myself but you know I can present in many ways <laughs> and actually what we're talking about obviously is a very individualized way of practicing medicine and so I there's this wonderful quote that um from your book um, where you talk about self-selecting remedies that appeal to us. Um, and I, I think that's exactly what has been lost in what has become conventional medicine, is that sense of individuality. Yeah. No client that comes to me is identical to another. And... Yeah. I am always me, but my approach can only ever be a response to the person sitting in front of me, because otherwise there is no rapport, there is no connection, there is no healing. And, and that is evident. So I really, I love that even in selecting the herbs that would be appropriate for an individual it is for that individual yes of 
absolutely absolutely and and Yes, there's no one size that fits all for herbal medicine. Absolutely not, or any other kind of medicine. No, you treat the individual because what you're doing as a herbalist is you're strengthening their vital spirit. And the vital spirit in Western traditional medicine is like chi or prana in other systems. It's like the energy that you have. And what you want to do is, is to build that energy up so people are able to heal themselves, which is ultimately what happens in good medicine. And that is absolutely a personal thing. Absolutely. I quite often get my clients, especially I'm working with preventive medicine, to grow their plants. Say, well, OK, get a Melissa plant, get some lavender, talk to it, you know, have a bath, have a tea. But, you know, so you have to develop a real relationship. And what that does is it empowers them, because the other thing about um, chemical medicine is that you're disempowered. You just give them something. You don't really know what it is. You cannot even pronounce it, and you just take it. Whereas I think we need to be empowered and take charge of our health, and that way we stay healthy and we're not dependent. I couldn't uh, agree more. Um, it is one of the well-known. There are some very well-known. Um, conditions for healing number one the therapeutic relationship is key actually even before that motivation to heal and change yes. is number one um, and that's mm. that we kind of think well you go and see a doctor obviously you want to get better but what you want is you want the symptoms to go away and we're talking about healing at a deeper level that understands that, this, that the symptoms are symptoms. They are not necessarily yes. the, the, the cause. And, and so, okay, we say, well, the symptoms um, are the, let's say, the, the trigger for a diagnosis, the diagnosis of the illness. But where we get lost is thinking that the illness is the thing and it's it's not the thing the illness too is a symptom of something deeper and so that requires the individual to be willing to consider change so for proper healing that is number one and number two of course is the therapeutic relationship um you have to feel that the practitioner in front of you whatever discipline that might be actually has empathy for you is connecting yeah. with you as an individual wants to hear your story wants mm -hmm. to understand what you're saying and because that's about trust yes it is if you have that then it's much more likely that you're going to consider engaging with the process and that is where the empowerment comes in. Is somebody saying to, to you, do you know what? Let's think about this. Let's think about it from a physical and an emotional perspective. And, and here's what you can do to help you with the physical. And perhaps we can talk a little bit about what to do about the emotional. Yes. And that's a good start then towards healing. And that's why I love this approach because it's offering possibilities and it's teaching the person self-care. You know, as, a, as a, a therapist myself, what I want is I want people to go away and feel empowered and feel like they are learning something about themselves that they are able to heal because very often when, when I see them, many have completely lost hope of the possibility that anyone is going to be able to, to help them or heal them. And I explain, no, it's not me, but I can show you the way and then off you go. And that's, that's tremendously liberating. So Absolutely, to yeah. done on a physical level where you can say to somebody, and these are the herbs that you need. And here's how you grow them. I'm just so excited by that. 
it's it's fantastic isn't it it's absolutely fantastic and again it's that connection with your body because we also are disconnected from our bodies we sort of handed over responsibility for our bodies to other people whereas if you're in that process of growing herbs and making your remedies and understanding the plants and understanding your physical and emotional and spiritual needs then you are re-situating yourself in your body. I mean, it's radical. I think it's incredibly radical. You know, if I were in charge, there would be, <laughs> you know, little apothecaries and herb gardens everywhere. And there are some. There's a really good project in um, Edinburgh that are working with on a, on a housing estate and they grow herbs and they teach the local people how to make herb teas. And they, you know, they're, they're really empowering these people who are quite economically challenged to do that. And in the years ago, I was in Nicaragua and they were subject to a blockade by the United States. So they couldn't import any medicines. So they had a whole system of herbal medicine. Everyone got a certain number of plants. They got about 10 plants. And there were little clinics set up around the country teaching people how to, you know, how to bring down fevers, diarrhea, all the sorts of things you get in hot tropical countries. Really basic first aid, wonderful system. And, so, and you don't need to import pharmaceuticals. You don't need to be in that whole system, which has become very corrupt. And I think there's a quote in the book, I'm not sure where it is, by the um, editor of the British Medical Journal who talks about the corruption in medicine because so many of the clinical trials are done by pharmaceutical companies. So it's a very murky business these days, which is not to attack doctors, but to just to say that that's where we are. Well, I... Of course, you know, we talk about um, it being a holistic um, type uh, system of medicine. And we think about it being holistic as in it takes in the whole the entirety of the person. And that's already something to get excited about. But I think when I use the word holistic in this context, for me, it's holistic, not just because of that, but because you were talking about the reconnection to the body, but it goes beyond because you're reconnecting to nature. And because we're in astrology as well, then you're connecting to something even bigger. And oh, yeah. so it, it's everything. You're connecting with everything. You're connecting with your body. You're connecting with your with. Um, mother earth you're connecting with the sky you're connecting with everything that is that is about life and that is why when this came through my letterbox and i opened it my heart just beat that little bit faster <laughs> it's amazing it's amazing and there it is the wonderful world we live in yeah and we are and what i think what herbal medicine does is it it reminds us how connected we are we're connected to comfrey which is a herb of saturn we're connected to our skeletal system we're connected to the planet saturn which has its cycles and its challenges and so on we're really connected yes yes and it's medicine of the people in america and here they have herbalists without borders where herbalists go to the front line of various places they work with homeless people they go out on the street and they give herbal remedies it's like it's really the spirit of cold pepper it's like not just for rich people, herbal medicine is people's medicine and it's radical. If you can walk away to some extent from pharmaceutical medicine, I mean, not entirely, obviously, but to some extent, you know, you are empowering yourself and you're freeing yourself somewhere. Because certainly when I started in practice 40 years ago, people would come and they would be on one or two drugs. Now, God knows five, six, eight, it's extraordinary. And you probably have seen the same thing. Extraordinary, extraordinary, exponentially. And that cannot be a good thing, that cannot. So yeah, herbal medicine is radical. <laughs> well, radical or not, I, and I was talking about how it connects us to everything. And of course you were talking about the phases of the moon and there's the seasons as well mm -hmm. um, that we're very connected with, not just because of when plants will give us what but also just um you, you talk about the way that the seasons affect health um so everything is in there and and you were talking about nicholas culpepper who um whose book sits 
um, always at hand. It's not on a shelf. It's there um, for me to, to still look things up. And now, of course, I shall be adding your book to that. <laughs> um, that little pile of books that I keep for easy reference. And so the book that we're talking about today, once again, is Traditional Western Herbal Medicine. Um, and there it is. And I just am very grateful to you, Elizabeth, for having written it and very grateful for your time today. It's been lovely to talk about it. So lovely. Very excited to still, after 40 years in practice, I'm very excited by it. So yeah, it's the future for sure. Well, thank you all for watching. I will be putting a link to Elizabeth's book in the uh, description box. And Elizabeth, if people wanted to find out more about you and, and what you do, how do they do that? I've got a website, it's elizabethbrook.com, so have a look. I do, I teach, I do lectures, I do online courses, all sorts of things I do. <laughs> but I'm based That's in London, but, but I work, I work in Greece, I work in various places, yeah. So lots to explore and, yeah. and that's absolutely brilliant. Um, and speaking of exploring, if you want to learn more about astrology, I have a fantastic course coming up, which is all about um, working with planetary energy to have a better understanding of it and make the most of your transits. Uh, it's called Working with the Gods, and it begins in the, I think it's the second last weekend of July, the 24th of July. So do get in touch and, um, and we'll see where we can go together. Next time, we'll be looking at life as an astrologer. Until then, goodbye.